to um, this latest EPRS policy roundtable, where we're looking at the state and the outlook of the European economy, which has, of course, taken an absolutely spectacular buffeting in the course of 2020, with what's expected to be around an 8% decline overall. And we're now beginning to look forward to next year, which we hope will be a year of transition back to something approaching normal, or at least the new normal. Uh, and we're delighted to have uh, a special guest today, which is the new head of the European uh, Directorate in uh, the International Monetary Fund in, in Washington, Alfred Kammer. He's been director of that European department since earlier this year, and he's going to give in due course his assessment and that of the International Monetary Fund of the outlook for the European economy. Before that, uh, Vice President Silva Pereira, uh, who is Vice President Responsible in the European Parliament inter alia for the European Parliament and European Union budget, for the European Citizens Initiative, for neighbourhood policy, and for relations in this context with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, is going to give some scene-setting remarks as to how the economy and its outlook looks from a more political perspective. He's been a member of the European Parliament since 2014, Vice President in the current term. He's a member of both of the Economic and Monetary Committee of the European Parliament and of our Constitutional Affairs Committee in the Parliament. And from 2002 to 2014, he was a member of the Portuguese Parliament, uh, including uh, a stint as the uh, Minister for the Premiership from 2005 to 2011. Alfred Kammer became, as I mentioned earlier, Director of the European Department in August this year. His previous roles in the fund, which he's worked for since 1992 was to serve as Chief of Staff to the Managing Director of the IMF, Deputy Director for Strategy, Deputy Director for the Middle East and Central Asia, and Director for the Office of Technical Assistance, and has also served as the IMF representative in Russia, among other roles. And then after they've had a chance to speak, we have a, a panel of economists who are going to give their perspective. I'll introduce them in due course when we get to that stage of proceedings. Cynthia Alcide, Director of Research at uh, SEPS, the Brussels-based uh, uh, think tank. Ian Begg, Professorial Research Fellow at the European Institute at the LSE. And Jacob Funk Kierkegaard, now Senior Fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Brussels and previously Senior Fellow at the Paterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, where he still remains a non-resident uh, Senior Fellow. Anyway, uh, you haven't come to hear from me. I'm delighted that we've got such a strong, uh, a wonderful lineup, in fact, to discuss these issues, which are very, very um, uh, contemporary, very, very immediate. And I'd like to ask, first of all, Vice President Pedro Silva Pereiro to set the scene and introduce today's proceedings. Over to you, Vice President. Thank you, thank, thank you, Hansi. Uh, good evening to you and to everyone. Um, as Vice President of the European Parliament in charge of the relations with IMF and the World Bank, as you mentioned, uh, I would like to uh, welcome warmly uh, uh, all those uh, attending this joint event between the European Parliamentary Research Service and the International Monetary Fund. And in particular, uh, I must thank the APRS, not only for the kind invitation, but also for um, all the engagement and work carried out on behalf of the, the European Parliament in this important relationship with IMF. Uh, it is naturally with great pleasure that we welcome here uh, Mr. Alfred Kammer, after his appointment earlier this year as Director of the European Department at the IMF. Director, you're very much welcome here. We look forward to a very fruitful cooperation. I think it is safe to say that we all wish to uh, to have uh, this discussion uh, in happier times uh, and in the presence of each other. Unfortunately, now due to the uh, current situation in Brussels, all over Europe and uh, in the United States and all over the world, circumstances have forced us to all this event in a virtual format. Uh, something we are all, all getting use of by now. Uh, nonetheless, I hope that uh, we can have a fruitful discussion and uh, that everybody can feel engaged with the interventions of our guests. Now, despite the many times difficult issues we have to manage, 
uh, it is important to highlight that uh, there always has been uh, close coordination between Washington and Brussels. For their side, the EU member states were able to frequently act currently in the IMF executive board and thus to advance coordinated uh, interests uh, within the IMF. In particular, I'm glad to say that the relations between the European Parliament and IMF have de developed in a positive manner in the last few years, even if they um, were not always been that easy uh, in the past. While the 2007-2008 crisis reinvigorated the global role and importance of the IMF as a conditional lender, as a surveillance uh, institution, and the technical advisor of financial reforms, the outbreak of the European debt crisis brought a new challenge uh, to the relationship between the EU and the IMF and to the way the uh, IMF role is uh, seen and understood by the European Parliament. The severe austerity measures implemented uh, uh, after the global financial crisis, in particular uh, after the Greek crisis and in the context of the great recessions and the sovereign debt crisis, were very controversial for their impact in many uh, European countries, especially in the South, with uh, serious consequences. And it is not worth denying that, that the European Parliament developed a quite critical assessment of many aspects of the recipes applied by the so-called troikas and therefore also by IMF together with the European institutions, the uh, European Commission and the European Central Bank. Anyhow, I believe it is fair to say that the differences in approaches by our two institutions did not last very long. Important studies and reports presented in the context of the uh, IMF contributed to a new common understanding that not well, not not all went well uh, on in those very difficult years. And uh, um, I believe that Christine Lagarde recognized that uh, back in 2013 already. This, Progressive convergence, if I can call it in a quite a, a provocative way, uh, pave um, uh, the way for uh, an improvement in our relationships. And uh, um, I think that uh, this discussion is also uh, a part of this uh, cooperation. Uh, and when we see today, uh, in face of this uh, pandemic crisis, the MF uh, warning about the unprecedented scale of the crisis and calling for more public investment and the truly pensionary alignment between fiscal policy and monetary policy, I think we can agree that uh, we all learn a lot with the last uh, financial crisis and uh, that this is in fact the common ground uh, to also agree that we now need uh, to find a totally different but still responsible po political response. So just about 10 years after the uh, Great Recessions, here we are again, confronted with a major crisis. Of course, the coronavirus disease pandemic is exacting uh, a severe uh, social and economic toll on Europe. More than uh, 60 million people have contracted the disease globally. Uh, nearly 1.5 million uh, of them died. Countries across the world had to take tough measures on social distancing, on lockdowns, and uh, had to face associated disruptions uh, in supply chains. This has, has led to a record downfall in economic activity and millions of jobs have been lost. Consequently, consequently national debt increased to uh, unprecedented uh, levels. Uh, governments face uh, an unbearable choice uh, of restricting social and economic life, with which depresses economy, of course, or introducing only uh, light preventive measures. Those might be good for economies, but pose a risk of more uh, deaths and threatened uh, overwhelm healthcare systems in many countries. 
So I will leave the presentation for our guests, of course, but um, the HIAM half latest regional economic outlook for Europe indicates that real GDP fell by um, about 40% in the second quarter of 2020. Uh, it forecasts now a 7% decline in Europe's GDP in 2020. Uh, it's biggest decline since the World War II. While the real GDP is projected to rebound uh, in 2021, a little bit, it would still be uh, lower uh, by 6.3% for 2021 relative to our pre-pandemic projections. Um, so what we can already recognize is that the pandemic toll on Europe could have been much higher without the robust and comprehensive response to this crisis. Uh, and that's also a lesson, a lesson for the uh, near future. Europe's policy response to the, to the pandemic has been unprecedentedly strong and multifaceted, and uh, I'm thankful to the IMF because IMF, have, uh, IMF uh, helped combating the adverse health and economic uh, fallouts from the COVID-19 uh, through providing financing, policy advice, and technical support to several European countries. The IMF uh, report also outlines how central banks embarked on substantial monetary easing through both conventional and unconventional means to support the flow of credit and prevent financial market disruptions. And uh, across Europe, governments deployed large fiscal packages to support households and firms with uh, uh, job retention programs, uh, which preserved at least 50, 54 million jobs, according to the uh, IMF figure. So, um, uh, if we uh, also take into account that the European Union uh, relaxed existing rules to accommodate increasing fiscal efforts, um, and uh, uh, we see that we have uh, uh, a strong response. Uh, now we have also these new financial packets, and I'm not going to enter into to, to details about um, the, the deadlock in the council, but uh, we all need understand that we need an urgent response and this money must uh, reach the real economy as soon as possible. Otherwise, the expectations of our citizens will not be, um, will not be uh, met. Um, I would like to conclude also uh, underlining some positive elements for the future. Uh, we see that uh, that at least uh, these new developments on vaccines gives us a hope that uh, on the health front we can have positive developments in the future. Um, um, I will list on those positive developments the election, the presidential elections in the United States, because they are important for. Um, multilateral cooperation uh, in many aspects, including the um, uh, health uh, front uh, of this crisis. Um, but from the point of view of the European Union, it is important because it gives us also the chance not only to also not only to promote uh, our um, transit act, uh, transatlantic relationship in new grounds uh, from the point of view of security and uh, external policy but also to end this uh, absurd trade war, which is damaging uh, our uh, economies uh, as well. But of course, from the economic point of view, uh, our um, most important uh, um, effort is to uh, ensure that this economic response from the European Union uh, is uh, adopted, uh, uh, operational, enriches the real economy. Uh, it is important not only um, from the point of view of its scale, because it's in unprecedented in terms of volume, but also from the point of view of its nature, because uh, it is um, based on uh, that issue by the European Commission, so in uh, um, with mechanisms of solidarity, which means something very important for the uh, future of the uh, European Union. 
So um, these are the elements. Of course, many risks are, uh, um, are there uh, in terms of the evolution of this pandemic and, uh, of course, the consequences it will have in our economies. Um, also, other risks. We are in a critical week uh, regarding the negotiations with the United Kingdom and uh, Brexit. Um, uh, of course, uh, we have problems enough. Uh, 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 it would be uh, wise not to have a no-deal scenario to all the problems we already face uh, in our economies. And um, these are the challenges. I just hope that the uh, discussions we are going to have this evening will help us to see the, the, the future that we should um, uh, build together uh, and also based on the facts, based on the analysis, based on the contribution of uh, IMF. And I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Vice President Silva Pereira, and for setting the scene um, so effectively and so elegantly. Um, and as you say, hope with vaccines, new opportunity with with the Biden administration and therefore potentially uh, more stable transatlantic relations and indeed a global uh, setting and effective, increasingly effective economic responses at national and uh, soon at European level. So um, we cross the Atlantic now to ask Alfred Kammer if he would like to outline the analysis which was in the latest Regional Economic Outlook for Europe, which the IMF produced uh, a couple of months ago, and to generally identify what he thinks the key factors that are going to determine how big and how quick a rebound we may see in the course of 2021. Over to you. Thank, thanks, Anthony. Uh, a good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, first, uh, thank you to the EPRS for the invitation to today's event. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce and present the recently published uh, European Economic Outlook uh, in, in, in this forum and to such a large audience in uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, Vice President Silva Pereira, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, pandemic has dealt a severe blow uh, to Europe. Uh, lives and economic activity has been uh, affected severely. But we also saw an exceptionally strong policy response that prevented more devastating outcomes uh, 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 in, in, in the course. And therefore, in my presentation, I will focus on these policies and I will also focus on the policies that have to continue uh, during this crisis. I will start with the uh, economic outlook and then I will immediately delve into the uh, policy part. There, of course, are many differences between European uh, countries and European economies. I will focus on the most uh, common developments and elements. So let's go straight to the forecast in uh, Europe. For uh, 2020, we expect indeed a massive contraction of output. Europe's GDP is projected to shrink by 7%. For 2021, however, we forecast a strong rebound with GDP growing by 4.7%. I should say, since our forecast was finalized in early October, several factors have added to the already extremely highly uncertain, uh, highly uncertainty surrounding this outlook. In the third quarter of this year, economic activity rebounded strongly after the record contraction in the second quarter uh, that the Vice President uh, mentioned. This snapback of economic activity reflected the success of policies. In the third quarter, actual growth exceeded our October World Economic Outlook forecast for all but a handful of countries in Europe. In blue on this chart, you see the projection embedded in our forecast. In green, you see the positive surprise in economic activity. Truly astounding and also reflecting again the uncertainty in making any forecast uh, during the pandemic. All of the forecasts are really driven by the virus, the response to the virus, and uh, that makes uh, uh, forecasting a very difficult part of this exercise for economic policymakers. However, the better than expected growth outturn in the third quarter will likely be followed by weaker than forecast activity in the last quarter of 2020 
and also in the first quarter of 2021. And that is due to the second wave of the pandemic, a downside risk that we forecasted and uh, 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 flagged, and that has now materialized. Rising infections and reimposed lockdowns have tended confidence and lowered mobility. So those two quarters will be affected by, by that. As I mentioned, uh, there's lots of uncertainty when uh, uh, about this outlook. And uh, this reflects the uncertain uh, pandemic dynamics. And uh, we continue to see downside risks, at least through early 2021. But there also has been very promising news on vaccine development. And that provides, first and foremost, a floor on the downside risks. But it also uh, uh, gives us an upside uh, potential. Um, a rapid delivery of safe and effective vaccines could indeed spur a faster recovery in Europe in the second half of 2021. There's, uh, as the Vice President mentioned, another European specific downside risk, and that is Brexit. Our projections continue to assume that a deal will be reached. And now let me go uh, to policies. The, the good news indeed is that the policy response to the crisis has been unprecedented. It was quick, it was large, and it was wide in scope. Looking ahead, it is paramount that the policy support will stay in place for some time. So what are the priorities? First, country authorities will need to calibrate both the speed and the strength at which they either reintroduce mobility restrictions or relax them in order to contain any damage from the second wave of infections. That's uh, uh, the utmost uh, priority. Second, for economic policymakers, accommodative fiscal, monetary and macroprudential policies have to continue to support demand in the economy. And third, targeted measures are needed to prevent a cascade of job destruction, bankruptcies and bank closures. Having said that, the risk of such a cascade of defaults is still with us and will only recede once the recovery is entrenched. And finally, and I will speak to that later, we will also need to support uh, increases in productivity, potential growth uh, through public investments, including by supporting a green and digital transformation. So let me now go into more detail on the uh, various policies. And I will start with uh, monetary policies and macroprudential measures. The large monetary and macroprudential easing instilled confidence and it helped bank credit flowing. Besides cutting policy rates where this was possible, central banks across the region resorted to unconventional monetary policy. As you can see in the left chart, the European Central Bank expanded its balance sheet by more than 15 percentage points of GDP with respect to end 2019, mainly through significant expansion of its asset purchase programs and liquidity provision to the financial sector. Many emerging market countries engaged in asset purchases programs for the first time ever. Macroprudential policies were also eased, including by cutting countercyclical capital buffers, as you can see in the right chart. All these measures helped maintain the flow of credit and supported the easing of monetary conditions. Debt moratoria and credit guarantees provided additional relief for borrowers. When looking ahead, well-anchored inflation expectations and sizable negative output gaps suggest that central banks should keep accommodative monetary policies in place to support the recovery. For the euro area, additional stimulus will be needed to facilitate a sustained increase in inflation and inflation expectation given the pandemic's deflationary impact. When it comes to macroprudential easing, it should be unwound only at a suitable gradual pace so to ensure that banks uh, maintain 
uh, continued capacity to extend credit. A bit of a global picture, which is also uh, useful. Uh, the ECB, the Federal Reserve, and other major central banks eased at the same time monetary policy at an extraordinary speed, and this helped restore stability in financial markets. The uh, European Central Bank also strengthened its support to central banks of non-euro area countries with new bilateral swap and repo lines. And the U European Union expanded its resources for macrofinancial assistance to help non-European Union countries limit the pandemic's fallout. We at the IMF, we provided emergency assistance to six European countries, as well as a standby arrangement to Ukraine. And globally, since the onset uh, of the crisis, uh, we have provided $100 billion to over 80 countries in need. So this was a truly global response, and it was a multilateral response, and that helped uh, Europe, that helped uh, uh, the, the, the global response, that helped national policymakers everywhere. On the fiscal front, uh, national authorities also embarked on unprecedented support with large discretionary fiscal packages being added to sizable automatic stabilizers. Both advanced and emerging European economies deployed programs aimed at protecting workers, jobs, and businesses. The policy response, in our view, was appropriately geared towards protecting the structure of the economy and to protecting livelihoods. When we look at the policy response, we see that a large share of the fiscal packages announced in 2020 was used for job retention schemes. These schemes have been incredibly successful in protecting jobs and livelihoods. They maintain the link between workers and their jobs, and they provided income. And I will come to this later. They were an essential part in uh, protecting the economy from medium-term damage, what we call scarring. And in fact, these programs have estimated have been estimated to have reached at least 54 million jobs. This is a really, truly large number of jobs and workers who have been benefiting from these programs. Scaling them back prematurely could lead to a wave of bankruptcies and widespread social hardship. They need to be maintained for the time being. To protect those that were left behind and to mitigate the pandemic effects on inequality, social safety nets were increased as well. And over the near term, national fiscal policies, together with grants from the Next Generation EU initiative, will also help mitigate long-term scarring and serve as a backstop to the recovery from the crisis. As I mentioned, fiscal policy support must remain in place in the near term. Uh, this is necessary to support the recovery, and the premature scaling back of support would drag countries back into recession. At the same time, uh, countries should start preparing plans to restore the fiscal package for a time after the crisis uh, has subsided. Let me now go to the corporate sector side. This is a very important element of the crisis response. And uh, I will spend some time on, 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 on this part. The policy response has mostly addressed liquidity, less so solvency gaps for corporates. This slide here is based on our analysis of millions of companies across 26 European countries. The bars you see denote the simulated increase in the liquidity and equity shortfalls in the corporate sector because of the crisis. And you also see how much each of the announced policies could contribute to addressing these shortfalls. In the absence of policies, the rise in the liquidity shortfall as a result of the pandemic 
would have been significant. Our simulations suggest that liquidity shortfalls could rise by over 7% of GDP for advanced economy countries and 10% of GDP for emerging uh, countries. However, the various policies announced by European authorities could fill a sizable share of the increase in liquidity shortfalls, especially in advanced Europe. Overall, policy measures in advanced Europe could reduce the rise in the liquidity shortfall by four-fifths. The impact is smaller in emerging Europe, reducing liquidity shortfalls by two-fifths. When you look at the right chart, it suggests that policies are less effective in addressing equity shortfalls. In the absence of policies, the rise in the equity shortfall is around 2% of GDP from before the crisis. In our view, wage subsidy schemes are the most effective measure to compensate firms for COVID-related losses. Overall, policy measures could reduce the rise in the equity shortfall by one-third in advanced Europe and by one-quarter in emerging European countries. The key takeaway are that in advanced European economies, the announced policies to support the corporate sector were very effective in addressing the pandemic-induced liquidity shortfalls. But at the same time, the ability of the announced policy measures to curb the increase in solvency risk appears more limited. This is because many of the aid schemes, such as debt moratoria, tax deferrals, and guaranteed loans, were designed to help firms fill their liquidity deficits rather than to provide equity support. To preserve the continuity of economic activity during and after the COVID-19 outbreak, policies may now need to refocus on strengthening firms' capital positions, particular of small and medium-sized enterprises. So this is a very uh, interesting chart, and we uh, uh, wanted to emphasize that uh, the policies in place and the policies uh, uh, which we believe should be uh, uh, continued can reduce scarring the medium-term negative impact of the crisis uh, uh, triggered by uh, the pandemic. So scarring is investment which is not undertaken and therefore new technology not adopted. It is workers who are uh, dislocated and therefore the skills are not being utilized or the skills are idling. When, when you look at these disruptions in any crisis, they will have costs for the medium term uh, growth outlook. And for policymakers to the extent possible, uh, uh, it is to prevent uh, such scarring uh, to uh, occur. We undertook a quantitative analysis of the impact of national fiscal packages, together with expected disbursements from the next generation EU funds on output. We estimate that output losses in 2020 could have been up to three to four percentage points larger without the timely and sizable fiscal support alone. So just the fiscal support already boosted the growth out out outcome by three to four percentage points. But as you can also see from the chart, this uh, baseline projection, the black line, is still below the blue line, and that was our forecast uh, in uh, 2009, uh, uh, from 2019. And it shows that such scarring, the longer-term effects uh, of the crisis, will still be with us in, in the medium term. And we expect that medium term output, therefore, is by about four percentage points of GDP lower than we projected pre-crisis. But there are other policy levers that can further reduce the output loss and these scarring effects. Let me go back to the corporate sector issues. Our analysis suggests that despite the extraordinary policy response, bankruptcies of previously viable enterprises will not be avoided. About 8% of firms that were solvent pre-COVID would become insolvent due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Even 
when we account for the extraordinary policy support. This is almost 3 million firms in Europe, and these 3 million firms provide more than 15 million jobs. The equity support needed to fill the capital gap of these firms at the end of 2020 is estimated to be 2.2% of GDP or 400 billion euros. Where could this gap filling exercise come from? It could come from uh, existing shareholders. It could be created by uh, debt restructurings uh, and also uh, through public support. Now, having said all of this, let me emphasize what the policy response on the corporate side prevented. And this is very important uh, to recognize, and that's why uh, we are emphasizing the importance of policy response and the achievements of policy response so far during the crisis. This policy support prevented firms from becoming illiquid, and it thus prevented cascading bankruptcies. We did a uh, simulation, and our simulation suggests that the policy support fully implemented would indeed have prevented a 15% decline in employment and a 25% loss in output. These are truly large numbers. And that's what I mentioned at the, the very beginning. The focus of policymakers was to maintain the structure of the economy, to see the economy through the crisis, and uh, to avoid the mistake of the uh, global financial crisis where the policy response uh, came too late and it was too timid. In conclusion, let me reiterate our key messages and policy priorities going forward. After the record contraction in the spring of 2020, we see a recovery is underway. But we also still face large uncertainty on the course of the pandemic and how to manage the reopening, and especially in the light of the ongoing second wave of, effect, of infections in Europe. Managing the distribution of vaccines will be another challenge in the coming year. Amid such uncertainty, we believe that strong policy support should continue to save lives and livelihoods. This will not only limit the short-term impact of the crisis, but also reduce the medium and long-term impact uh, by preventing scarring. Regarding monetary policy, additional stimulus is needed to support the recovery and facilitate a sustained increase in inflation. For the European Central Bank, an expansion of asset purchase programs will be the first line of defense. Coming to fiscal policy, fiscal policy will need to continue providing broad-based support during the second wave of the infections. Where policy space is limited, policies will have to focus on the most critical areas, but international support can help expand policy space. So this is what I stress that support needs to continue uh, through the uh, second uh, wave. Once the pandemic waves and the risk of lockdown recedes, then policies will need to transition from general lifelines to supporting firms with good post-pandemic viability prospects and helping the transition of workers from sectors that may permanently decline in the aftermath of the pandemic to those that will expand. So this is also a very important part because we will see structural changes in the economy and the policies need to be geared to facilitating that these structural changes uh, can uh, take place. So we suggest that uh, countries encourage only viable firms to take advantage of policy support while facilitating the exit of non-viable firms and strengthen bankruptcy procedure so that this can happen quickly. And job retention schemes will need to be made better targeted towards viable jobs. And these should be complemented with measures to facilitate the movement of workers uh, to viable firms. That can include wage subsidies, but that could also, uh, should also include job search, retraining, reskilling uh, for workers. 
the fiscal resources that will be gradually freed from temporary support should then be redeployed to accelerate public infrastructure investment, especially on digital and green technologies. This is critical because it will provide a boost to aggregate demand, but it also will help increase productivity and potential output, and it would place Europe on a path towards a greener and more sustainable economy. And that's where the next uh, 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 the, the recovery fund uh, comes in. And the recovery fund will be very targeted because support will be channeled uh, to those countries which need the support most to focus on productivity, to potential growth and transformative policies uh, to become green and sustainable. I uh, would not want to mention that we also need to think about measures to tackle rising regional disparities and inequality. inequality. We need those in particular to support those that were disproportionately affected by the crisis, such as women, the young, less skilled and educated. And last but not least, the authorities will have to start preparing plans to repay policy space and tackle the public and private debt overhang so that this can be implemented once the recovery is firmly established. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Alfred. That was really uh, interesting and covered a lot of ground, much food for thought, and I'm going to go straight to our panel. We're going to comment on what you've said, maybe probe you a little bit in terms of issues that you might want to come back to later on. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, hopefully, a chance for questions and answers. We've got basically about 45 minutes left uh, for this event. So um, I'm going to invite each of our three panelists to talk for maybe around eight minutes each, and then we'll have about 20 or 25 minutes after that for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A function, which for those of you who are on hybrids, as I think many people in the parliament are these days, is in the bottom right-hand corner uh, of the screen. Um, and I'll try and take as many questions as I can uh, in the time that we've got available. So the fir first up in terms of providing a uh, commentary on what's just been said is Cynthia Alcide, Director of Research and Head of the Economic Policy Unit at the Centre for European Policy Studies, SEPS, the Brussels-based think tank. She's also a research fellows, uh, fellow at Luis uh, School of Political Economy in Rome, former employee of the International Labour Office, and former uh, lecturer in international economics at the University of Perugia. Over to you, Cynthia. First of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, many thanks, Anthony and the EPRS team for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's not the first time uh, I'm invited to comment on the economic outlooks uh, of, of the IMF. It's always a pleasure. This is a key document uh, for us to, to work with. But I have to admit that never has this year I looked at the uh, world economic uh, outlook uh, um, as many times um, uh, as, as this time, um, mostly looking for um, updates uh, um, in the forecast. I mean, uh, this is, of course, uh, a very key uh, element in uh, trying to understand the, the impact of, of COVID and also uh, trying to um, assess the, the recovery. Uh, in my comments, I, I will not actually look um, at uh, the forecast, but I want to focus on two points which are uh, related to, to, to the policy uh, dimension. Uh, the first point is that, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's quite impressive that uh, um, uh, European advanced economies are actually the group of countries uh, for, for which the full in GDP is the largest uh, worldwide. And um, I think we really need to, to, to understand why it is. Of course, so we have a, a number of ideas um, and um, I, I will put forward a few, few elements. The second point is that uh, um, it, what was not explained in the presentation, but actually it emerges from, from the report, is that despite COVID uh, can be seen as a purely exogenous and symmetric shock, the impact of, of COVID, of the pandemic on, uh, on European countries have been, uh, very, has been very asymmetric. So uh, if one looks at the, um, uh, the forecast for the, for the GDP fall in uh, 2020, uh, there are a number of countries for which uh, the fall is, uh, is two digits. 
Uh, so uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, it's uh, above 10%. Uh, France and Greece, very close to 10%. This is a huge uh, fall in, uh, in GDP. For other countries like uh, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and also Ireland, it's uh, either 6% or below. So it's clear that the impact of, uh, of, of the pandemic has led to a very different economic uh, performance. Um, one question is why? How can we explain uh, this? Uh, we have tried to, to do some, some, some exercise and, and basically our results uh, point to, to the fact that two factors um, are key. Uh, the first one is the uh, intensity of, uh, um, of the stringency measures, so basically restrictions to mobility. Uh, this has been applied uh, across all the countries, but the intensity has, has been different. And in fact, uh, in those countries where um, restrictions to, to mobility were, were higher, uh, tend to, to display a larger form. This is also quite logic. The second element is actually the importance of certain sectors of the economy, uh, sectors in particular that can be related to, to tourism, but essentially those for which um, social contact is, is most important and which those sectors which have been affected in a, um, in a larger way uh, by the lockdown measures. So food and accommodation and transport and, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, this basically points to uh, uh, two uh, forms of uh, asymmetric impact. Uh, one is, of course, at country level, and one is at sectoral level. And uh, um, I would like to, to highlight this second point, which is also uh, was mentioned also in, in the policy um, and messages um, which uh, Alfred made. Um, so the sectoral dimension. I think it's uh, especially on, on the way forward when we think of uh, policy measures that uh, can continue to support the economy, we may want to switch from an approach where the, the policy has a very broad and with larger scope as it has been until now. I think this, this, is, this was necessary. Yeah? You really need to, to mitigate and, and to protect. Uh, that, that is the, the purpose of sort of aggregate uh, policy measures. But on the way forward, it will be more and more important to focus on targeted policies, um, which basically take, take into account the fact that certain sectors have been um, hit in a, in a much stronger way and sectors for which restructuring uh, will be necessary, uh, even when the, the, uh, the vaccine will be ready and basically the, the pandemic will be under control because certain habits may have to change the behavior of people may change in, in a structural way and the, um, in the provision of certain sectors in the consumption of certain goods uh, we may not be able actually to go back to uh, the, the pre-pandemic um, approach so this is this is this is crucial um basically in terms of moving from policies which tend to, to protect in a broad way to then um, contribute to a relocation of, of resources, skills, um, um, in a way that basically the, the recovery can take place in, in, in a sustainable uh, way. The second point I want to stress uh, relates to the, to the way the lockdown measures have been implemented. Um, I can give you maybe the, the example of, uh, of Belgium, which was one of the first countries to experience a second wave. So basically, um, if we look backward at the, the different quarters of this year, uh, basically, the second quarter was the one of the lockdown where the, the GDP fell dramatically. Then during the summer, the third quarter, we had very nice surprises in, uh, in, uh, in, in a number of countries. And then in the last quarter, actually, we expect again a fall, especially in certain countries, which have been forced to put in place again um, lockdown measures. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, measures are now relaxing in a number of countries, also in view of, of the Christmas break. And some countries are preparing or considering that uh, new lockdown measures will have to put in place after Christmas because there may be a new wave, simply because uh, people will not respect uh, measures, even if they, they remain in place. So we will have uh, ups and downs or sort of uh, on off lockdown uh, measures which actually translate in ups and downs in um, in the gdp um, over the, the quarters um, to some extent this is in inevitable uh, this is a bit outside the discussion of, of this panel but in many countries uh, actually uh, people are, are becoming quite 
intolerant or do, want, do not want to accept any more um, restrictions to, to personal freedoms. Uh, this is, uh, is, is becoming and there will be actually a, a growing debate. So in this sense, national authorities have been forced to, to, to relax uh, measures. Um, but nonetheless, I think one important question, which, uh, uh, which is important in terms of control of the pandemic, uh, but also economic performance, is whether this on-off <laughs> sort of approach to, to the policy is actually efficient and effective. Uh, and, and this is, I think that this question is uh, still relevant not only in a, in a, a, a backward-looking perspective to, to understand what has happened in 2020, but because basically uh, we need to be very realistic for 2021 when even if a, a vaccine will be ready, uh, until the full, the entire population can, can access it and uh, basically the pandemic will be in full control, we will have to, to wait a number of, uh, of months. Um, so, in, in this sense, I think this is, uh, this is an, an important question, both from uh, the point of view of the control of the pandemic and uh, on the, um, economic performance. I will leave it here and uh, or we can follow up uh, later on if there are questions. Many thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Cynthia, for that. Uh, two very big questions there. So, the asymmetry uh, of the impact in the European economy, and secondly, the effectiveness or potential danger of this on-off, stop-go aspect to uh, lockdowns and its implications for economic recovery. Next up is Ian Begg, Professorial Research Fellow at the European Institute at the LSE in London, Associate Fellow of Chatham House, uh, until recently co-director of the Darendorf Forum, which is a joint LSE Hertzi sort of government um, initiative uh, between London and Berlin. Over to you, Ian. Right, uh, thanks very much, Anthony, and uh, thanks in particular to Alfred for a, a very rich and uh, I think in some ways optimistic presentation. I dare say that uh, when you walk in the streets of, of uh, Washington these days near the IMF, you'll be hearing the cry, we're all Keynesians now. Maybe the, the famous uh, Washington consensus will have dissipated. I should point out to, to viewers that uh, this is my second encounter with uh, the European directors of the IMF today because I was uh, commenting at lunchtime on his uh, Alfred's predecessor, Paul Thompson, giving a seminar. I should also point out that I have not been using Trump's makeup artist. It's the strange lighting in the room I'm in that makes me appear orange. Now, on, on to some substance. I think that forecasting in, in these circumstances is, as Alfred said, a very tricky exercise. And there's a danger in the, the trickiness of that exercise, which is to take forecasts at face value, rather than to regard them as being more like scenarios, very contingent on certain assumptions, particularly the, the rollout of vaccines, the, the absence or presence of a third wave of infection and so on. It looks as though we're in for what's been called a W-shaped pandemic, economic effect. We thought initially it might be V-shaped, sharp downfall followed by sharp rebound. Now it's been sharp down, sharp up, probably sharp down again over this quarter and the next quarter, and maybe a long recovery after that. We may need a, to add a further W to that if third and fourth waves were to occur. I want to emphasize something that Cynthia already alluded to by quoting one number that I heard Marco Butti, the chef de cabinet to Commissioner Gentiloni, mention a couple of weeks ago when he said that when you look at the latest commission forecasts, not the IMF ones, although they're very similar, and compare where Italy and Germany are now relative to the start of the European sovereign debt crisis, in other words, 10 years ago, Germany on the basis of these projections coming out from the Commission, is likely to be 12% up on GDP since the, start, the, the sovereign debt crisis. Italy is minus nine. Now that's a magnitude of disparity which ought to alarm us enormously because the tensions in the Eurozone when the disparities were a couple of percentage points are considerable already. But when two of the biggest economies are diverging to that extent, we have to consider what it may mean for the future. And moreover, if you look at the, the projections from other forecasters, again, with the caveat I said about 
and them being scenarios as much as forecasts, Italy, France and Spain, the three, three of the four biggest economies in the Eurozone, are not expected to be back to their 2019 level of GDP before 2023. Now that is significant political economy implications because there are electoral cycles in this period. And whether it's justified or not, many electorates are going to be looking at these kinds of figures and saying, you let us down. You have not dealt with this in a way which justifies us re-electing you. And it's, it'd be no secret that this could bring to the fore many of the populist parties that have made inroads already for different reasons. Let me suggest that there are three risks that didn't quite, quite come out in Alfred's presentation that we might want to look at a bit further. The first is macroprudential. There's been a significant increase in public debt everywhere. It's what you expect when you have a Keynesian response, when you have all, all these ex expenditures on Kurzarbeit and related programs. It's correct. But that increase in public debt is going to be is going to stay with us and it's going to diverge because the countries likely to come out of the pandemic crisis fastest are those on the whole with the relatively lower debts and those with the higher debts are likely to take take longest that is going to create financial financial stability tensions i think we need to look at the macro prudential risk in all of this the second is what i would loosely call consumer wariness we know that there are many sectors, and Chinthia already alluded to this, which are, have taken very much more significant hits, in particular transport and tourism, but also a number of personal services, particularly related to uh, servicing workers in large cities. The hospitality sector, these are all areas where what you forewent in not consuming it during the, the crisis period isn't going to be caught up again when things get back to normal. There is a dead weight loss of those kinds of activities. And it's by no means obvious that a sector like aviation will recover in any time soon the, the scale of consumer confidence and willingness to travel that we saw prior to the, the outbreak of COVID-19. Some may say that's a great thing because it's, it is in, in consistent with green objectives and sustainability. But we should be aware that the consumer's changing habits, and in particular consumer wariness, may lead to a reduction in consumer's expenditure, which therefore needs to be made up by either government expenditure <coughs> or investment expenditure if GDP at an aggregate level is kept going. And the third concern is a specific one in relation to next generation EU. It sounds great, and let's assume the difficulties that the Vice President referred to earlier around not having a decision in the Council are resolved later this week. Bold assumption, I know, but let's assume it, it's dealt with soon. There's a different problem, and that is how rapidly and how effectively some of the countries which are allowed to be net recipients of NGEU money can absorb the new investment. Here, the lessons from the structural funds, the, the big European investment programme to support cohesion policy are not very encouraging because some of the countries that are expected to receive most relative to GDP as a proportion of next generation EU are those who are slowest and least effective in using their existing allocations of structural funds. Having been on the whole negative, let me conclude with one positive point that might be worth picking up in, in discussion, and that is the the fiscal space that we have in an environment of zero interest rates gives far greater scope for larger debt. So the fiscal headroom in debt sustainability is much greater than it has been in the past. We can we can live with high debt for much longer because the debt service charge, at the moment at least, is negligible. And therefore monetary policy is going to be pivotal in determining whether or not that debt service charge remains low. It does put great pressure on the ECB, but also on the other national central banks of those countries outside the Eurozone to, to continue to use the instruments that have enabled interest rates to remain low. And that may be the big challenge for the, the period beyond the direct consequence of COVID. Thank you, Anthony.
Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Four very important points to be picked up, hopefully, in the ongoing discussion. Uh, has this has this whole uh, experience really dented the credibility of forecasts and therefore um, how viable is the outlook that's been painted? Uh, secondly, the divergence between successful and less successful economies, taking Germany and Italy as the counterpoises there, uh, does that pose a systemic uh, instability threat? Are there macro third, are there macro prudential risks and or consumer wariness, which will have a downward uh, implication? And fourthly, what's the absorbability in effect of the next generation EU spending? Thank you for those very uh, insightful and interesting points. Now, last but not least, Jacob Funk Kierkegaard, Senior Fellow uh, for really the last few months since he returned to Brussels at the German Marshall Fund, uh, having previously been in Washington for many years, where he was also a Senior Fellow at the Paterson Institute for International Economics, and I think is a non-resident fellow still there, previously worked in the Danish Ministry of Finance for the United Nations and has written widely on um, microeconomic issues. Over to Jacob. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you very much, Alfred, for a very in interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm actually going to t pick up pretty much where uh, Ian left off because I want to focus because my remarks on, uh, first of all, the issue of the scale of the fiscal policy response in the uh, EU, as well as the fiscal and debt uh, overhang, as Alfred uh, termed them, uh, the extent of these issues. And then I want to move on to what uh, these issues and the circumstances actually tell us about uh, potential needs for reforms of EU fiscal rules as well as uh, other institutional changes that have occurred in the EU during the pandemic. Um, but let me let me start by uh, uh, certainly saying uh, that it's wonderful to uh, for I can't remember when I for last saw an IMF forecast that had uh, I think four, four to five percent growth for the year for the EU for the next year. So that. That's certainly the good news. Uh, and I also agree absolutely with uh, Alfred's uh, overall assessment that uh, for the time being, uh, the main concern is to avoid economic scarring uh, and both in terms of you know return to pre-pandemic GDP levels, uh, labor market effects and the like. So fundamentally, currently the risk really is, you know, rather we, the, the, the risk is greater to do too little uh, than doing too much. Um, but then let me also say that uh, the big question, of course, is, well, for how long uh, should that remain the overarching fiscal uh, or policy response imperative? Because it's, it's very clear, uh, that was also pointed out by, you know, Alfred and, and previous speakers, that the main uh, uncertainty here is, of, of course, the extent of the pandemic. Uh, we, we know that uh, we have a vaccine uh, being rolled out. We don't know quite yet to when it will, uh, you know, reach the sort of general level of uh, dissemination in the economy and among populations that economies can be reopened for good. Uh, but it's safe to assume, I think, that this will be sometime during the second half of 2021. However, uh, as both uh, Ian and Alfred highlighted, uh, there is this uh, big issue related to uh, the potential for sh uh, lasting shifts in consumer preferences as a result of the uh, pandemic. Ian just mentioned the airline industry. You know, you can think of, of a lot of the movie theaters, cruise lines, uh, and the like. And the reality is, we simply don't know what they will be, uh, but they are likely to be with us. And Therefore, the uncertainty uh, surrounding them are likely to be with us well beyond the rollout of uh, <clears throat> vaccines. Uh, and this, this takes us to this issue that Alfred uh, uh, mentioned, namely that at some point, uh, uh, fiscal measures in the European Union will have to uh, transition from sort of immediate employment, uh, you know, continuing employment support, uh, wage subsidies and the like to basically facilitate the uh, structural reallocation within the economy between firms that are viable post-pandemic and those that may not be. Uh, however, I would caution and say that uh, this 
that is a very uncertainty surrounding that issue which uh, sectors and firms will be viable or not is is go going to be acute uh, even after the pandemic. We simply don't know when consumer preferences will shift. What we do know, however, is that the overall ability of, co of co a government, oh, sorry, of economies to facilitate uh, economic transitions, uh, uh, reallocations among sectors is going to be much higher in a, an overall macroeconomic environment of growth. Uh, which highlights that even in the period well beyond the pandemic itself, I would argue that the uh, level of aggregate demand in the economy uh, is going to be uh, very, very important, and therefore that there is a very strong case to maintain an overall uh, high level of fiscal stimulus uh, in the uh, EU economy as a whole well beyond the end of the pandemic. Um, a pandemic emergency simply because the uh, sectoral reallocation uncertainty is going to be with us uh, uh, for for much longer than the pandemic. Now, this obviously raises the issue of well, what about uh, the debt overhang, uh, both public uh, and private, that Alfred and and also uh, Ian and mentioned towards the end. Uh, I will say here that I absolutely agree with uh, what Ian just said, namely that uh, uh, the fiscal space, so to speak, within the Euro area, uh, and therefore the debt, uh, debt maintenance capacity uh, of, of member states is going to be much higher uh, than previously uh, uh, imagined, I would contend. Uh, and just to give you an example of that, the most recent market forecast for ECB uh, uh, policy rates for the euro area is basically pricing in negative rates until the end of the tw decade of the 2020s. So we're basically looking at the uh, markets are now expecting the ECB to be unable to re you know, restore quote unquote monetary policy normalcy for at least a decade. Uh, which, of course, is another way of saying that the debt service cost and therefore the debt service uh, capacity of member states in the euro area is going to be uh, very high and much higher than they have historically been uh, for not just the short, the medium, but quite likely also the long term, because it is not clear uh, where the uh, inflationary uh, impetus for the euro area is going to come from uh, in in, uh, in even the long run, and therefore the ability of the ECB to restore normal, uh, uh, if you like, uh, monetary policy is going to be significantly uh, impaired. And as Ian said, the pressure is certainly on uh, the ECB for that. However, this obviously raises, in my opinion, some pretty significant policy uh, questions for the euro area, because currently, of course, the Stability and Growth Pact uh, is suspended. The general escape clause has been evoked. Uh, we know that it will remain suspended for the at least 2021, uh, but we don't know what will happen beyond that. Uh, I would, however, uh, say that in light of the analysis that I just presented, it's certainly my view that uh, the Stability and Growth Pact should remain suspended well beyond 2021. Uh, and I would even go as far as to say that given that the uh, projected rollout of the Recovery and Resilience Fund or the Next Generation EU is going to peak in 2023-24. Uh, it strikes me as nonsensical to re uh, re uh, reintroduce a stability and growth pact uh, before that happens because you're going to end up having uh, basically fiscal consolidation at national levels uh, countering the expansion of effect of uh, next generation EU grants. Uh, and we also know from previous experiences that domestic fiscal consolidation is going to disproportionately affect levels of public investment. Uh, so you're going to have precisely countering uh, policy implications. So there's a very, very strong case to maintain the stability uh, and growth pact suspended for a while, uh, e quite a while longer. And even, I would continue, and perhaps even fundamentally reform it. Because uh, given that we are in this realm of uh, persistently long uh, or high, higher levels of debt servicing capacity at, uh, at uh, EU member state level, the obvious question must be, does it make any sense to 
retain a stability and growth pact that is anchored around a 60% debt uh, debt level uh, uh, that was basically the status or uh, the circumstances in the early mid 1990s which is essentially a long bygone era for the euro area that isn't going to uh, be with us anytime soon and i would obviously contend uh, that this is not the case uh, so uh, you basically cannot re introduce the Stability and Growth Pact unless you first fundamentally reform it. Um, and then finally, let me uh, uh, just very quickly say that uh, I certainly believe that the uh, next generation, the, the creation, uh, implementation of next generation EU is, is a very important important step forward in fiscal integration for Europe, uh, but it raises the interesting implication that it is not fiscal integration that has previously for instance, been called for by many, including the IMF, fiscal integration at the euro area level, but actually fiscal integration at the EU level, uh, which raises some uh, potentially significant political economy questions going forward, some of them of which, of course, are playing out right now with the standoff uh, on rule of law between uh, the EU and two non-euro area member states in Hungary and Poland. So let me finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jacob. Very interesting points too there. High degree of uncertainty, which sectors will or will not prove viable and who's to judge that. Um, uh, Alfred Kammer talked about, um, and they, they're, rather, uh, they're rather easy um, technocratic words, but they have quite significant political resonance, facilitating exit of non-viable firms. How's that going to play out uh, politically? Um, the debt stock and overhang thereof, reform of fiscal rules. How far is the suspension of the Stability and Growth Pact likely to prove permanent? How credible is the SGP going forward? So really interesting and meaty issues there and a terrific set of responses, if I may say so, to the original presentation. I'm now going to um, before um, giving um, Alfred Cameron the opportunity to reply to those, as I'm sure he'll want to, I'm going to take a couple of questions that have come in from the floor, um, and two of them perhaps grouped together. Gonzalo de Menthosa asks, how far can EU policies fill the gap? And is there a risk to the EU financial system? Obviously, we live in fear at some point in the future of a second uh, banking crisis. And uh, Antoine Rapal asks, what further EU moves should there be? And how far can Europe and the United States, in effect, take advantage of the moment to help stabilize the global economy? Right, so, um, and we'll be taking further questions uh, shortly, but let's go back to Alfred Kammer to get his reaction to not only those questions, but the various issues which have been raised by our three panelists. So back over to Washington, DC. Uh, th thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you for these uh, very thoughtful uh, remarks uh, by uh, all of the discussions and uh, question. Uh, maybe uh, one point on, on Cynthia with regard to the uh, asymmetry of how countries uh, were hit. Uh, one important part is also the virus, because the virus has uh, uh, impacted on countries uh, uh, very uh, differently. Policy response. Uh, we see, for instance, with regard to emerging market in Eastern Europe, they did much better in uh, the uh, uh, first wave. And the reason for that is they were hit by the first wave uh, later and they took action much earlier. And so one of the uh, outcomes of this uh, experience with the virus is, and we are driven by the virus here, is that uh, early action pace and then gradually reopening is a uh, better strategy than a, a quick reopening. And that has uh, uh, some impact on uh, how uh, countries were hit and how countries could deal with the virus. But much depends really on the virus and the pandemic. And we understood very little. We, we learned, lo uh, learned more. And so we, we need to be a bit forgiving in terms of uh, these, these res uh, res re responses. The, uh, W that we saw first wave, second wave. I think the good news on that one is uh, we have now uh, light at the end of the tunnel. There is another side on uh, for that bridge to land with the policies on uh, maintaining the structure of the economy. And that is the vaccine. 
in, in, in a case where there, there, there would have been no vaccine or a problem with the vaccine, that uh, going through that space would have been much more difficult. But now that we know that is an endpoint and a likely endpoint, still some uncertainty, but that also creates confidence. And that also creates credibilities uh, to extending the policies in place and maintaining those policies to prevent uh, uh, the structure of the economy to fail. On forecasts, yes, uh, a, a very uh, a difficult issue indeed. And uh, the forecasting is for all of our economic models uh, driven by two things, modeling the virus. So we are talking to epidemiologists and looking at uh, responses uh, to fighting the virus. So we have assumptions in there for uh, lockdowns, how these lockdowns uh, 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 materialize, the intensity of the lockdown. I should also add, it's not just the lockdowns, but it's also the change in behavior of, of people. And I think uh, uh, Ian and Jacob were uh, alluding to that in, 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 on, on, on the way out. So they go into uh, uh, these uh, uh, forecasts. Initially, we were thinking about giving ranges of forecasts, but since we are doing uh, country by country, uh, very detailed forecasts, we uh, uh, in, in the end concluded a point forecast is more useful, but at the same time also outlining the risks and having scenarios in, in case the world develops differently. And the world has developed differently than we projected in uh, October. Divergence uh, of, of countries. I think one of the big lessons uh, uh, of this interim period from the global financial crisis uh, to this pandemic is when uh, there are good times, countries need to take action in order to build and rebuild fiscal buffers to have these buffers available. And I think this is also going to be a lesson uh, uh, after this crisis, that there is a need to rebuild fiscal buffers so that there is fiscal space available for another crisis. Second, growth matters. And uh, for growth uh, to take place, uh, uh, one needs to uh, undertake structural reforms to increase uh, a productivity, to increase uh, a potential growth. And uh, the diverging growth numbers uh, show that uh, uh, growth matters uh, over a, long, a longer period of time. And growth matters for the uh, ability to actually uh, service uh, debt. Consumer variance, uh, aggregate demand, one big suggestion on our side, recommendation on our side, is that uh, uh, if the recovery is firmly in place, we still need support for aggregate demand. Uh, uh, so there's no, uh, there, there's no question about it. And we actually think the uh, EU Recovery Fund is providing a very potent tool in, in terms of providing that aggregate demand uh, support after the recovery has uh, taken hold. National fiscal measures may also still be needed. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, that that is uh, uh, required. On the EU Recovery Fund, absorptive capacity for some of the countries will be a, a big issue. One, first, it is a big opportunity uh, because the money can go into infrastructure, in public investment, that can boost growth quite, uh, quite a bit. 1% uh, of infrastructure spending can, in Eastern European countries, boost growth by uh, two percentage uh, points. But for that, money needs to spend uh, uh, efficiently and effectively. And clearly, this will be a demanding exercise uh, for countries. Some of them receive, in grants, 14% of GDP. These are large numbers. These are large uh, opportunities. Uh, on the structural changes, yes, absolutely. The pandemic will lead to structural changes in the economy. And a part of government policies needs to be uh, to facilitate these changes. And that means exit of firms to have this done as efficiently uh, as possible. And sometimes we will need to look at bankruptcy procedures, how can how they can be sped up. Uh, but it also means uh, looking at workers, how to reskill, retrain them, and to move them from one job to the other which uh, help with wage subsidies, but also job search. This is a bigger issue, uh, uh, I think, than just the pandemic. When we were discussing before the pandemic uh, the AI revolution, we were talking about uh, accelerated speed of automation. And the conclusion was we will have dislocation of uh, workers and of firms. 
And what we need for that is a system of retraining, reskilling to facilitate uh, shifting workers uh, and to upskill uh, 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 workers and to have the social safety net of not uh, leaving anybody behind, including education, lifelong learning uh, to create uh, 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 equality of uh, opportunity. This was before the pandemic. That's a need after, uh, after pandemic. And the transformational changes we are looking at with green and digital again will lead to this location. And again, the same type of policies are uh, going to be required uh, for, for that part uh, as well. So we, we may want to think about uh, this uh, much more uh, coherently and, and focus on it. Because inequality of opportunity of income in the end is uh, a, a problem for, the, for maintaining the social fabric and therefore is, is, a, is a paramount issue uh, to be uh, uh, looking at. On, on that, uh, indeed, uh, debt service uh, capacity will be increased because uh, uh, interest rates will be low and uh, our expectation is that they will stay low for uh, longer. Uh, one important point I try to make in this uh, presentation is growth will matter for the ability to, to service uh, uh, debt as, uh, again. And therefore, we are trying to prevent the scarring and uh, uh, growth will help dealing with uh, the higher debt stock. But I should also say when it comes to fiscal consolidation and creating that fiscal space for the next crisis, one important part is that uh, many of the expansionary fiscal policies are going to be self-liquidating. They were focused on the crisis, and as long as they are temporary, uh, uh, taking these policies away uh, should, from a political economy point of view, be uh, relatively easy. This is not the typical consolidation effort we are looking uh, to. Needless to say, that high debt countries will look, need to look at additional consolidation measures to create that uh, fiscal space. But not to forget, productive capacity of the economy is uh, uh, immensely uh, in, in important. On fiscal rules, it's a fantastic time to review those. And uh, the European Union uh, is, is, is doing that. Uh, we have views on the fiscal rules, uh, so clearly we should not uh, uh, implement the existing ones uh, too early. Second, uh, uh, we believe that uh, 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 we uh, should look at some changes in those fiscal rules, which we uh, have been uh, ad ad advocating uh, for a while. And, and finally, in the terms of the institution, we still believe that a central fiscal capacity uh, uh, would be useful. That central fiscal capacity is different from the recovery fund because it would be a, a counter cyclical instrument and not providing uh, transfers, but that would be useful uh, in terms of uh, managing uh, cyclical uh, shocks. On the questions from uh, the, the audience, I think we need both parts. Uh, we need e-recovery e funds and the whole uh, uh, funding made available through the various instruments in order to provide that support for aggregate demand uh, coming uh, out of the crisis and also uh, uh, the supporting public investment, which is going to uh, increase potential growth uh, in, in, in the medium term. So far on the banking system side, uh, the banking system has been resilient. The banking system had much larger buffers uh, than uh, during the recession. Key there will be uh, an efficient way of dealing with non-performing loans so that they are, they are taken care of quickly and don't uh, uh, have the uh, banking system focus on working out uh, those uh, non-performing loans. EU-US, global demand, global financial stability, absolutely essential. And uh, uh, I should say, we had a global pandemic, a global crisis, and every country was being affected. And we had a global response. Uh, the first big part was the easing of the Federal Reserve and of the ECB at the same time. That helped uh, the countries, the central banks are serving. It helped the global economy by easing financial conditions and avoiding uh, a financial uh, crunch time and uh, problems of emerging markets in particular to access the market. And both the US and the European Union 
had very sizable fiscal uh, res responses, which were supporting uh, global aggregate demand. We will also be helped by China coming out of the crisis uh, um, uh, uh, quickly. That will also help in terms of uh, stabilizing uh, uh, global aggregate demand. So, uh, Anthony, I think I answered most of these questions, but uh, happy to uh, go into more depth if you wish. Thank you very much. Very crisp, very effective review and response to so many issues. And we've subsequently had uh, a series of new questions that have been asked. One or two of them you've already um, partially or indeed uh, wholly responded to. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of issues that have been raised. One is Laura Pinello asks, Pinello asks um, how do you see the, uh, the new normal or the next normal that we're being confronted? And picking up on something that Cynthia said, I mean, what long-term changes do you think there might be in people's behaviour in the economy, um, which don't revert, as it were, to the status quo ante, and which we need to factor in in thinking about the future? in your own forecasting, of course, but more generally in policy policymaking. Um, and then Samuel uh, Zabolontsny, uh, apologies if I've, I've mispronounced the name, he asks a very interesting question about the relationship of the Euro member states and the non-Euro member states, and here picks up in a way on something that um, Jakob said towards the end of, of his comments, which is that an interesting feature of the of MFF response, but more particularly the next generation EU, is that it is, of course, EU-wide. It's not specific to the Eurozone. People have been assuming that the next big fiscal advance, if you like, in the European Union would be Eurozone only. Now, what are the implications of that? How do you read that in terms of uh, the evolution of European uh, policymaking? Maybe leave it at that for the moment. Yeah. Uh, the first one is a very difficult to, uh, question to answer, and uh, I, I will not be, be, be able to answer it. The, the new normal will certainly look very different from uh, the old normal, but we don't know at this stage what, uh, how this new normal is, 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 is going to uh, uh, look like. On changes in consumer behavior, uh, he, I think, is also what Cynthia suggested. He is targeted policies and policies which are going to facilitate uh, a, a structural change. I think that's a very important uh, part of the next phase. So far, we have focused on uh, maintaining the structure of the economy, and uh, we have been focused on maintaining livelihood. In the next phase, we need much more targeted policies. They are, they are focused on facilitating structural transformation. and uh, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we need to pick the winners. We need to have the policies in place so that the economy can structure reform uh, itself and that we are uh, uh, eliminating some of the side effects. And I alluded to some of them uh, already on the worker side, where we need to have help in job search, where we need to have uh, uh, retraining, uh, reskilling, uh, education, but also we need a social uh, safety net that allows workers to uh, 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 supports workers uh, during this period. And we also need uh, uh, an incentive system in place so that workers are uh, incentivized to provide uh, a new, uh, new uh, 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 incentivized new jobs. And on the firm side, again, what is important, and Cynthia already uh, pointed this out, uh, we best for the economy when transformation needs to take place, that this is done uh, uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, so uh, bankruptcy procedures in some countries uh, um, may uh, need to be tuned up to, uh, to allow that. At the same time, uh, there is a good reason to maintain and support viable companies. Uh, 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 there's no need to uh, look at the destruction uh, of, of those, not, not only not a need, is not is not desirable uh, uh, to 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 have that. Uh, so that is an important element in terms of the, the the structure of these economies. But as with the pandemic, there's a lot uh, we are going to find out uh, as we evolve. And uh, again, that requires a lot of flexibilities on the uh, policymaker side uh, to take uh, action uh, uh, relatively quickly and to. Uh, uh, policies to evolve 
as we are uh, recovering and going into uh, this uh, new normal. I'm not sure I have much to add uh, in terms of the Eurozone versus uh, the European Union in, in terms of uh, uh, the institutional structure and the uh, uh, fiscal uh, integration uh, structure. Uh, in, in our view, the EU recovery fund uh, is uh, an essential element in order to buffer the asymmetric impact uh, of the pandemic uh, on, on, on countries. Uh, it also is helping uh, very much uh, uh, with regard to the aggregate demand support in and uh, as an EU instrument uh, available to all uh, of, of the countries. And last not uh, least, the focus on public investment, which usually suffers in a crisis. The EU Recovery Fund uh, uh, will maintain and uh, hopefully also uh, expand that. And we have uh, been calling for additionality of these funds of being used, because that will increase potential growth in the medium term. And that will also help the, trans uh, the transformation of the economies uh, to green, to digital, and make the economies uh, uh, more sustainable. So all of these uh, uh, three objectives are extremely important uh, to have in mind, and the e-recovery fund would uh, address and work towards all of these three objectives. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question here, which is from Joanna Buck, which is about leads and lags in uh, e economic policy making. We, we talked about the on-off aspect of the lockdown situation, but um, one of the questions is, is the money coming through in the right form at the right time? And I would like to um, uh, complement that with a question, which is really to do with Although the Next Generation EU Recovery Fund has been held up somewhat compared with what was expected, could it actually be quite helpful, not only because the spending is better prepared than it would otherwise be, and therefore of a higher and more effective quality, but conversely, um, that it could be uh, in its own way slightly counter-cyclical, because there might have been a tailing off in some of the support from the member states as national finance ministries regain control and start to uh, impose strictures. Mm -hmm. I think on the national responses, uh, the, the the money uh, to firms and and workers came uh, very quickly and in a in a in a very timely way. And on the e recovery fund, uh, first of all, we're very happy to see that some of the countries, uh, most of the countries, have actually been working on the national uh, plans. Some of the countries have been uh, concluding their national plans. Uh, that has been done in a very expedited and uh, a timely manner. Uh, what is, what is clear on the EU Recovery Fund, the way we see it, it's uh, coming in over the next few years, uh, Anthony. So it's exactly coming uh, in terms of spending at the right time when national programs are going to tail off. And when we need further aggregate, uh, aggregate uh, demand support into the medium term. So the timing of the EU Recovery Fund uh, looks, looks, looks perfect. Are we worried about uh, uh, delays? Uh, not so much because there is ample of uh, uh, borrowing capacity and, and space for countries uh, to move forward. And the absence of these funds at the current time is, is, is not a, a limiting factor. What would be good is to have confidence that the EU recovery fund is, 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 is coming and that will be very important for making public investment decisions. And also for, uh, is, can the time be used? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the IMF has an instrument, uh, public investment management uh, uh, reviews, and the number of uh, countries in emerging uh, Europe in particular are taking advantage of this instrument in order to improve uh, their management selection and the management of public investment uh, projects, because we know it makes a huge difference uh, whether the right projects are selected and whether they're implemented with good governance uh, 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 ex expeditiously. And so, yes, uh, some of our member countries are taking advantage of this time in order to gear up uh, for these public investments uh, 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 which are coming in, in the next few years. Thank you very much indeed. Um... If everybody can just stay just a few more minutes, I'm going to invite each of our three panelists to come back with a single bullet point, uh, one minute each. First of all, uh, uh, Jacob. 
Oh, I just wanted to highlight one thing, which is that while I absolutely agree with uh, the points Alfred has made about the need for many European countries to facilitate flexibility in the economy, provide, you know, active labor market policies and, you know, smooth the entry and exit of firms. I think we should at the same time be conscious of the fact that, you know, not everything may change after the pandemic. If you look at uh, even modern economies that uh, no longer are suffering from uh, COVID, take Australia to some extent almost, to certainly New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, others. It's not clear uh, that these kind of economies are fundamentally uh, revamped uh, or needs to become fundamentally revamped as a function of this pandemic. Uh, there may it may therefore have straight merely have strengthened existing trends, whether it's you know artificial intelligence or other trends, uh, rather than been this sort of mythical fork in the road. Um, so let me finish there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Cynthia? Many thanks. I would like to actually go back to uh, the debt issue and related to the uh, public investment. Now, um, I shared the view, which was uh, the point which was made by um, basically everyone uh, concerning the fact that low interest rates, of course, help that sustainability. But I think the main concern for I that countries like my home country, Italy, is actually low growth. I, I think Alfred uh, made this point uh, very clear. So uh, in terms of forward looking perspective for a country which is adding at 180 uh, percent debt to, to GDP, growth is actually uh, crucial. Now, of course, in, in this uh, uh, perspective, uh, um, next generation EU can play a very important role. Uh, first of all, because of uh, grants uh, would allow not to increase the debt further, uh, because loans would allow to, to guarantee almost zero interest rate for, for a long period, and hopefully the money is invested um, for a good purpose. Now, the, the main problem with it, and this we have been looking at, uh, I've been looking at some of the um, uh, national reform programs. In fact, what it, it will go uh, for um, uh, public investment is a relatively small part. And the fundamental reason is that uh, over the years, the capacity of governments to invest directly in the economy has been shrinking. This has been a, a global trend. The public investment are in the order of 2% uh, in uh, advanced economies. So it will be unrealistic to expect that this jump to 10% in, in, in a couple of years. So in this sense, we really need to remain realistic, but it, it remains a fact that the investment will be a key uh, driver of, of the economy. So there, if the government cannot invest directly, the key question is how the, the money can be still put into the economy and to fit productive investments. I, I will leave it here. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Final remark from Ian. I'll try to be super telegraphic, Anthony. First, the new normal we, we heard a lot about. There are two aspects of that that are worth emphasizing. The first is that if we are in a new normal, which encompasses extremely low interest rates for the indefinite future, that has distributive consequences. Already prior to the, the, the COVID crisis, we'd ha had significant objections coming from German savers that they were their sparkas and were paying them next to nothing and they lived off that. So that, that's a consideration. Related to that, oddly, no one's mentioned inflation. Inflation is one way in which you can get rid of debt. It may be that if we're in an environment of low interest rates and low pressure coming through on prices, that inflation will also remain indefinitely low. I want to avoid exceeding my uh, 60 seconds one finding I can give to you from a survey I did recently is concerns whether next generation EU is either a Hamiltonian moment, suddenly the EU wakes up to the need to have debt, or I think the more accurate answer is it's a crossing of a Rubicon. It's become something that is acceptable to the EU body politic. And the finding I had in, from a survey of uh, over 110 experts is that 90% expected what is supposed to be temporary to become permanent. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Let's see whether in 2021 Hamilton crosses the Rubicon.
Uh, it just remains for me to thank all of those who've participated. Uh, Pedro Silva Pereira for setting the scene so effectively. Uh, Alfred Kammer for sharing the insights, thinking and uh, forecasts of the International Monetary Fund. We really appreciate that and hope we'll be able to have the chance of, of doing this uh, regularly uh, over coming years. And our three panelists, uh, Cynthia Alcide, Ian Begg, and Jacob Funk Kierkegaard, for offering, as always, pithy and testing insights and putting our speakers under a little bit of pressure. We really appreciate it. It's been a great discussion. Uh, this is the penultimate policy roundtable which EPRS is doing this year, uh, during this calendar year, and it's great to have been able to do it in conjunction with the International uh, Monetary Fund. The final one of the year will be this coming Thursday uh, at 5.30 in the afternoon, Central European time, when think tanks, mainly Brussels, but not only, will be uh, indicating what their takeaways are from the experience of 2020, a year which I think people will certainly remember. And then our very final EPRS event of the year, not a policy roundtable, but a book talk, will be uh, next Wednesday afternoon uh, at 1400 hours Central European time with Natalie Tocci, who's going to be talking about her book on defining uh, EU a global strategy. Thank you very much to everybody who's participated. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you also to those who've been on the digital floor. We peaked at around 90 people today. We're still in the region of about 50. And it's been a great discussion. I think we all come away from it much better informed. And we'd like to thank everybody involved. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.